today we are continuing the uh, study of the household initiate and the body forms. We're dealing now most of the female body. I said before, eye contact is very important for the female body. The female body telegraphs most of its feelings through the eyes and because it telegraphs its feelings through the eyes, it's easily picked up by the expression in the face. It is the particular anticipation in the female body of picking it up. That's why when they see someone, they're always more attuned because that feeling of nesting has a magnetic pull. Magnetism pulls something to itself. When an object is a magnet, it attracts to itself. Because the female body is a reproductive body that carries the offspring, the magnetism has a tendency to vibrate and goes out through the eyes to draw to it. The magnetism in the eyes of the female body is low when the body is going through the menstrual cycle. It's very high prior to the mental cycle, menstrual, menstrual cycle, and after the menstrual cycle, the magnetism is very high. The pull is very strong and very electric at times. Sometimes it glows, the eyes glow. One can see it, there is a glow or a glint. Now in the male body, this is different. The magnetism in the eyes are only strong at night. They're very weak in the daytime in the male body. The female body, the magnetism is strong in the daytime, but weak at night. There is a fluctuation also in the time of the moon, when the moon is full, the male's body, the magnetism is very strong in the eyes. In the first quarter, the last quarter of the moon, the female body, the magnetism is very strong in the eyes. When the body is sick, The, the magnetism in a female body is very weak. But the only time it's strong is at night, not in the daytime. When the male body is sick, the magnetism is weak and is very strong in the daytime, but weak at night because it vibrates differently. Now, the magnetism can be built up because it has to do with electrical movement inside by focusing. When the, the eye is centered on some specific object Without wavering, the magnetism is increased. Now we can shift the magnetic field in the eyes by shifting the breath. We have a form of breathing known as the magnetic breath. Now this occurs in the act of sex with the male and the female when the 
magnetism is shifting by the eyes. The breathing gets very heavy and deep. Now this is true in the yoga breathing. When you breathe through one nostril and hold it, and then breathe out through the next nostril and hold it, you breathe in back, hold it, breathe out, and hold it. This is what is called the alternate breath or cleansing breath. At the same time, it's a shifting breath for the magnetism in the body. This breathing can now shift the magnetism in the eyes for the male or the female body. Since we only breathe through one nostril at a time every hour, most of us are breathing a little less than one hour or a little more than one hour through one nostril. When you're completely polarized, you're supposed to breathe exactly 60 minutes through one nostril and out six, within that same 60 minutes in the other nostril. You never breathe in both, through both nostrils, you never breathe out the same. The human body does not breathe in through both nostrils at the same time, nor does it breathe out through both nostrils at the same time. It breathes one stronger than the other. One of the nostrils is stronger, and you can check it. When you blow it out, you'll feel there's a difference in strength between one nostril and the other. For some, it is on the right side, for others, it's on the left side. It changes every hour. This alternation is synchronized for the polarity of the body, and it's synchronized for polarity of the eyes. It is that form of breathing that we can now strengthen the eye magnetism and direct it. Now, your magnetism is weak when the nostril is breathing in from the left side. When the left nostril is breathing in, the magnetism is weak, and the eyes cannot generate that charge. When the eyes don't generate the charge, then the whole magnetic charge is negative. When the nostril is breathing through the right side, and the right nostril is drawing the air in, then the magnetism is increased. Then the eyes generate that charge. Since it shifts every hour, there are 12 hours in which the breath is going to be on the left side and 12 hours on the right side. Now, since each hour it alternates in drawing the magnetism in for the eyes, you have to start with the right nostril to build that magnetism up. A spiritual master is one in, in which he has learned to recognize the polarities of the body and he knows exactly which hour to switch over. He would not execute the energy out of his eyes in a negative charge, only in the positive charge, and that is on the right side when he's breathing through the right side. Now, because he's polarized, he also knows how to stabilize the negative charge. Therefore, he can always shift the breath. If the breath goes onto the left side and it becomes an emergency for him to generate that consciousness, he can shift it. <coughs> there is a way for him to shift it back to the right side to, for him to work magnetically and release the nostril, release the energy through the nostril and magnetism through the right eye. The energy is very strong and it's coming out through the right eye and by the breathing through the right nostril. Since the magnetism shifts all the time, by the breathing, it shifts in the position of the eye. When you breathe through the left nostril 
and out through the right nostril, the magnetism is negative in the body. But at the same time, the negative charge is flowing out through the eyes. When you breathe in through the right nostril, the body is positively charged and the magnetism is flowing out through the eyes in a positive charge. But this changes every hour. And you have to start building the magnetism at the point of the day from a positive charge. You have to count it. You have to check it. That it sees that the, the breathing is exactly 60 minutes. If there is a overloading of the body from too much in one nostril and not enough in the other nostril, then there is an imbalance in the magnetic pull. And you have to breathe to correct that. You have to correct it through the focusing of the eyes. The, since we are stimulated, the female body is stimulated by sound. Now, you have to learn to listen to the sound of the ear in the nostril and get the awareness of it to build that magnetism. Since the man is stimulated by sight, he has to get the awareness by feeling the length of time the air is going up the nostril in order to build up the magnetism. Now, let's take the male body first and then we'll take the female body. The male body is stimulated by sight. So, breathe in through your lungs right now and check how long the air stays in and see which nostril is throwing out the air, left or right. And those who have right nostril for male body now, let them raise their hand. Those who have left nostril, well, which is right? Are you breathing through your right nostril very strong? You, right. So we have two people breathing right through the right nostril. Now who are breathing through the left nostril strong now? in the male body. You have to check it to find out which nostril you're breathing through, the strongest, or breathing out the strongest. We have two right, then the rest has got to be left. It's very simple, blow the air on, your, on the hand with your nostril and see which one has the strength, the most force for the female body. All right, then we have three, three male bodies vibrating on the left side. So the magnetism is low now. Those who are pulling in from the right side, the magnetism is high at this particular hour. All right. How many women are breathing in through the, the strongest through the left side now? Left side. One, two, three. So we have three female bodies drawing negative charge through the left nostril. So how many we have with the positive now? One, two, three, four, five, six. So seven. Seven people are pulling in on the right side now. Those who are pulling in on the left side now to bring the energy over to the right eye so breathing through your left nostril and focus most of your attention through the right eye all those who are breathing through their left nostrils the strongest now start to send out and feel the left eye generating more energy the right eye you're breathing through your left nostril but you're generating energy out of the right eye 
If you're breathing through your left nostril, focus the energy out through the right eye. It's got to be left to right. So those who are breathing in through the left nostril start to focus the energy out through the right eye. In other words, if you want to close your eye and push it out, push out the eyeball, push it forward to make the energy go there. Now those who are breathing through the right nostril will try to force the energy out through the left eye. Now if it finds it difficult to do, all you have to do is close one eye and let the other eye that is going to send the energy flow out. Now feel it flowing out of the eye. Keep the eyes steady and don't blink. Now those who are breathing through the left nostril and projecting out through the right eye, raise the left hand and clench the right fist. But raise the left hand so that the energy is coming through the left fingertips and clench the right fist. Now the others will reverse. Now begin to feel it building up now in the spine, rising from the base of the spine, all up the groin, right up into the head. This magnetic charge building up. Now the magnetic field is exactly 17 inches from your body around you. The first six inches is the electrical field. The next 11 inches out is the magnetic field. <coughs> Bless you. Present tight. From then on out, feel this magnetic field around you and its biggest potential is from the tummy. Now if you feel like a, a pressure outside of you, around you from that area, it's the magnetic field that is vibrating against your body. Now, as you keep the eyes steady and focused, let the whole face begin to smile. The cells are now going to be electromagnetized now as they start polarizing. See, only in a smile can the body be magnetic. It can't be magnetic in a front. Now feel it tingling through the whole body, all the cells smiling. Now to increase the magnetic charge, reach out and grasp the hand of the person next to you. Now build up the charge by feeling it passing through the hands now all the way through.
gradually, as you build up the charge, you will feel that the breath now will start to synchronize. The magnetic field will start building up by synchronizing with the breathing. It Now you can feel like a warmth flowing out from your eyes. That magnetic field now is becoming in a state of unity. And the whole body will start to feel the glow of the magnetic field. Now you nourish the body magnetically this way. Hold on and let the whole body nourish itself magnetically because it's an electrical polarization that is occurring within the cells now. Your body is setting up like a charge, a battery charger. You're like a battery hooked into a battery charger and the whole body is charging itself and feel that charge passing all the way through, passing all around in the room now. And you are electromagnetically charged up. Now, when you let go of the other person's hands, Bring the two palms together and retain the charge in your body and feel the charge now is building up in you as an individual. The whole body is now charging it to its maximum magnetically. Now some of you may have goose pimple sensation when you touch your fingers. Others may feel like a quiver or the glow is being sustained. Once this is experienced or that glow or that subtle movement in the spine is felt, the whole body is magnetized. Now if you want to transfer this magnetism to your loved one or if you're married or to a friend, then you transfer it from your right hand. You always transfer the energy by your right hand. Now, in order to give you an experiment of transference, let one male, one female reach out and touch the back of the neck with the right hand. And this will give you the transference of feeling. So you want to try it. The magnetic touch. So go ahead. Just behind the neck, with both hands. One hand, the right hand, you're transferring with your right hand. Okay, try somebody else now. Give another person a chance to feel it. Right behind the neck, place the cup of the palm behind the neck so that you know what you're transferring or feeling what is being transferred. You're not doing it correct here, you two. Right hand on neck and right hand on neck. Not that way, you face each other and
Okay, try somebody else. <laughs> try somebody else. Get the get to know what you're transferring or feeling. What you're transferring is being felt and what is being transferred is being felt back. Okay, try somebody else. With memory of past life, or immaculate birth, or direct materialization, most of us are born having no past memory. We are born simply having no memory of past life. The, the whole gist of mankind is in that category, either outside of the marriage uh, vows or inside of the marriage vows. A host of us are born that way. And it is paramount in the desire makeup of the individuals that attract that type of individual into the home. The now, the immaculate conception goes through the same uh, <laughs> cycle of nine months? Yes, it goes through the same cycle of nine months, but there it is natural childbirth without medical attention, no housewife or midwife or anything. It is performed by mantrams. By recitation of certain mantrams, the, the child is being delivered without labor pain. So those mantrams, you know them as the psalms. They are those psalms for painless childbirth that are written by the initiates thousands of years ago. You can look it up and you repeat it if you're a woman and come through natural childbirth with pain-free sensations. They are designed primarily for the release of the child from the womb without the pain sensations, both for immaculate birth or for birth without memory in past life or birth with memory of past life. Those mantras do exist. Yes? Um, I thought immaculate conception meant uh, the child, the seed was in the woman without any prior sexual relations. It is performed by extrasensory insemination. Extrasensory insemination of the woman is immaculate conception. That means without sexual relations. When we use the word sexual relationship, we only know of the fact that it is the perforation of the, the, the organs by the, the two forces. That's all we know to mean the word sexual relationship. Sexual relationship is extrasensory because it's electro-biomagnetic through tactile contact. This force field, when we demonstrated two days ago how you can massage the body and pass the hands along the body without touching it, what was happening? Wasn't the same energy passing through your body and I was not touching you all along the spine? Well, that's just an extrasensory biomagnetic transference. Now imagine this particular type of exercise or massage, once understood by the initiate, carried to its highest point of procreation. The mere passing of the hand over the, the body would transfer these forces now. When Jesus was born, before he was born, the mother Mary and Joseph were initiates of the Master Hillel. The Master Hillel had to be instrumental as a focal point to bring in this particular condition between these two forces. A donor has to be there, a recipient has to be there. The transition between the two requires a third person. That is the guru, the guru who will transmit extrasensory, the donor's uh, sperm into the recipient's body by an extrasensory transference without physical contact but it is extrasensory insemination. Now, when you're in uh, artificial insemination, there is no perforation by the donor to the recipient. It's implanted by a physical uh, equipment, but this is implanted now by a bioelectromagnetic contact of concentration by looking at the transmitter or the donor and draw the energy out from the donor 
it's an electro entity now and transmit to the recipient that entity force and that entity force is taken in by osmosis and therefore the body begins to spread now or stretch now image therapy it's very easy to recognize it in image therapy when one goes through image therapy because that is a possibility to see it in the reliving of the nine months in the womb the individual can see certain indications of the possibility of extrasensory insemination occurring in them. So it is not merely that the two individuals are involved. It is an electrical transference that is involved. Now, what is the extrasensory perception? It is perception beyond the physical range, which the physical range is conditioned to accept as normal by normal methods of behavior. Extrasensory behavior is an electromagnetic polarization that requires consciousness and tactuality or contact with touch, not necessarily perforation by touch, but it can be transferred by contact. Now, doctors know that immaculate conception or extrasensory insemination is a reality and the offspring is an exact pattern of the mother. Therefore, it should be a daughter every time it occurs. It occurs in animals now without the donor being ever near. It's just like how the ferret will kill its opponent by using a sonic beam by hissing and kill the, the animal. Now, the extrasensory insemination is a sonic beam induced by the heightened breathing of the male donor without physical contact. It is a form of the holy breath in transition from one being to another ultrasonically. Therefore, transmitting the sperm into the ovum and depositing it by sound waves. And there it will start to take root and expand. So nothing is impossible. Doctors know it's possible to have uh, extrasensory insemination or immaculate conception. Now, before Jesus was recorded as a immaculate conception birth, Rama's wife Sita was recorded as an immaculate conception birth thousands of years ago. She was of immaculate conception too. But she was a woman born under the same principle. Now, but she was born in Sat Yoga, in the descent of the astral clock, thousands of years ago in the time of Rama. Now, since the astral clock is on the top of the 12,000 cycle movement, and Jesus is born at the bottom of the cycle clock on the Iron Age, it had to form polarization. So, Polarization occurs when the first record of immaculate birth took place, the offspring was identical as the parent or woman, then the second recorded manifestation would have to be a man to balance the cyclic clock on the descending arc of the universe. So Jesus had to be born in the fourth year of BC, entering into the Iron Age or what you call the Dark Age. And he came in now at that point to polarize the descending clock. Now we are in the Aquarian clock moving up now. We are moving into Dwapara or the Aquarian age or the Bronze age. So the possibility of immaculate birth to come back will start a new type of polarization. So the chances are of immaculate birth occurring again will be a woman first before a man on recorded history because it must go in cycle movements of positive, negative, positive, negative. So you see the householder life is a fantastic culmination of all the laws of nature bordering on the human body. And when we look at ourselves as being a channel for these principles, we are indeed fortunate to have a human body to work it out. 
Now you have to realize this. From the standpoint of survivalness, you're the only sperm that became you. And the standpoint of self-evaluation, as a human being, you can trust that force that brought you to maturity as a human being to make it possible for you to experience God realization in this body. And if you don't trust that force, how would you know it? So you don't know, but you got to trust it. That's faith. Good. Then mine is not the reason why, mine is to do and live. Well, right, so I sit down and wait till the master come out of the room because he told me to sit down here till I come out. Okay. So don't you just sit down and live? Yeah. Don't question if he's going to come out or not because you don't know when he's going to come. You may want to go to the bathroom and he wants to come at the same time. You see, this is exactly what happened to Elias and Elijah. Elijah was uh, meditating one day and Elias, the student, went to him, or Elisha, and he said, Master, why don't you give me a double portion of your spirit? And he said, you ask a hard thing. That is, you're asking for something for nothing. You don't want to work for it. But nevertheless, this is compassion or grace. If you see me before I go, that means if you, you are present before I leave this body form, the darshan or the spiritual transference or the spiritual will, the transferring of the power, the transferring of the ma uh, masterhood, is yours. The mantle is yours. You will now be the next initiator. You will take over and run the boat. Good. Providing you are present or you see me before I go. Elisha didn't bargain for that because he was put in a position when he, he would not know when the master will go. And the master having cosmic consciousness, and he don't have it. He don't know what time this master is going to pull a fast one on him. So that's the way it is today, man. <laughs> right. He can't sleep. He can't eat. He can't even leave the presence of the room and go no place. So he's stuck. He had to work double time now to catch up for what he didn't want to work for. You see? Right. You see? <laughs> it's great, huh? Because you don't get something for nothing. But the master taught him a lesson. How are you going to get something for something by putting him to the test? So he made him. Now had to meditate in the Master's presence. Now he couldn't even bear to wake up and let any of the bodily functions interfere <laughs> with the, the Master's behavior or his own personal behavior or desire to be in that state. See, the Master tripped him. But that was a good lesson for him. So when the master was ready to go, he was present and he gave him the, the experience. He, he had to recognize this though before he could ask for it. Well, naturally, we always ask for more than we can chew. Our eyes are bigger than our mouth, you know. Oh. That's where that came from. Yeah. You see, we see things and the mind says, I can handle it, I can cope with it, I got the gump or the gumption or the willpower to do it. When you bite, then you find out there's more than you can chew. You can only do one or two things. Hang on or let go. <laughs> Nine times out of ten, you will rather die choking with it than letting go. Only because of your pride. <laughs> well, the master wants more. He knew how much pride he had. <laughs> <laughs> you see, but that's how the game. You see, what is, a, what, is, what is tragedy for this disciple is, is jokes for the masters. <laughs> well, how are you going to get rid of it? The master's got to play tricks in you to, to free you from your ignorance. <laughs> so he's walking a bag of tricks all the time. Watch it. <laughs> 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 I remember one boy he was telling us he's a professor of psychology he said he went to India to see one of the masters so he's at the, the uh, ashram and he's got a whole list of questions he's going to ask from psychological standpoints so he can write his thesis 
And every time he asks these questions, Master gives him the most ridiculous, insipid answers that even a child would not dare give. And he was there for 21 days, and for 20 days he was in turmoil because the Master would never give him any detailed scientific explanation, mere platitudes, mere nonsensical answers. At the point he was all cracked up inside, and the last day he's got to come now, he's going to cry coming to the Master. And the master see him coming, and the master scratched his nose. As soon as he got close, the master said to him, I see you working on your thesis. Uh, why don't you go back and uh, complete it? Why waste your time here? <laughs> then he realized what the master had done him. <laughs> because what good was he sitting for 20 days in the Master's presence and never really absorbing anything? <laughs> he says, that sure pulled the plug out from under him. He now realized what he was doing. He was blocking all the answers to all his questions by his own intellectual way. And the Master was not an intellectually going to satisfy him. He was just going to let him work out all his exhaust. See, the master worked him like a cowboy works a bucking bronc at the rodeo. They let them run till they get exhausted and they're tame like pussycats. I have found that when you ask a great deal of questions, sometimes you get ridiculous answers. Not that they're intended to be ridiculous or uh, to ridicule you or to make you look stupid. They're intended primarily for you to look at yourself, what you're really saying about yourself. And you don't recognize your own ignorance coming out from what you're saying about yourself. And that the answers to what you're looking for are already locked up in the questions that you're making. And if you can reevaluate the questions with a different attitude, you will see the answers. Now, some of us are looking for confirmation in our answers from other people by the questions we ask. Yet confirmation is not satisfactory because another human being says yes. Confirmation is only satisfactory if you can live through the experience over and over and get the same identical result without deteriorating your nature. If you repeat an experience over and over, and it brings you some heightened degree of joy, and it don't tear you down, that is confirmation. You are triggering it off now. No man take my life from me. I have the power to lay down and pick it up. You are triggering off the experience now. Well, the same thing would hold true if you uh, uh, did the same experience, uh, had the same experience over and over again, even if it tore you down, you know, well, it's still an actuality, it's doing something. A true experience would not tear you down to the extent that it will make you uh, feel despondent. It will build you up. It will always build you up. A true experience. Otherwise, uh, then you would differentiate something. It's true if it lifts you up. It's not true if it tears you down. Right. It should always build you up and leave you in a heightened state of joy. No matter if you don't have no inner visions or inner experiences, but the after effect should be that emotional joy, that bliss, tears of joy, not tears of sorrow. Let's drink a cup of coffee. If I approach that cup of coffee with the attitude that this is bad for me, it's got to tear me down. If I approach that cup of coffee with the attitude that this is fine because it comes directly from the cosmic source, it's got to lift me up. So the attitude would be the important thing. If you go into meditation with being scared of hell in the dark, maybe you're going to be scared of hell in the dark, you know? I mean, that's the way it's going to be. You All know? right. So the attitude that you approach something with is the key.
Yeah. Well, you remember the boy and Yogananda when they saw the the stuff that the dog had vomited up? Right. And uh, the boy said, you mean to tell me you believe that God is in everything? And Yogananda says, yes. He says, you mean to tell me he's in that stuff that the dog brought up? Yogananda says, yes. He says, well, if you eat it, I'll eat it. So Yogananda walked over and picked it up and ate it. And then you can see the other boy's face and the <laughs> upset. <laughs> <some. Sure>, <laughs> <laughs> but then he started to run. Uh-huh. But that was the wrong thing he did. Because Yogananda was not going to let him get away with running. And he ran after him, caught him by the collar and pushed him in his mouth till he, he ate it. But when it went in his mouth, it was one surprised boy. It never had no odor or smell or taste. So he got to live through the experience. But he had a, uh, what you said, two by four flash of light in his head. <laughs> <laughs> like if somebody cracked him up, he got zapped. You see, some of us get zapped the hard way. No, any master, once he accepts that God is the light, the radiant form, and he tells you that it's there, the experience can be brought into your life to satisfy. And it's the bliss, because the boy admitted in the end, it was not the food that he tasted, they had no taste was a sudden realization of the joy that the whole body was tingling for the first time, trembling with joy. He didn't see God as somebody standing up in front of him. He didn't see God as some man in the, in the handful of food. All he felt... He was eating these words. That's what he felt. Right. <laughs> Verbs and adjectives, pronouns and everything back here. I'll do it if you will. <laughs> <laughs> I do it. You know, sometimes when you read the story of these spiritual men, they're so factual and so comical that you wish you don't hang around near them. (laughs) You know, their jokes are a little too rough. (laughs) You see, wise men love to joke now and then. But they don't like to be the butt of their jokes. Yeah. Book the Nanda, yeah. when he was studying it, in the book I read it, and uh, yeah. was, uh, the great Lord himself came to teach him a lesson, and he came in the form of a leper. Uh-huh. And he had ugly sores, pus dripping all over, you know, and he come limping into the place, and so uh, Book the Nanda's teacher told him to feed him, and so when he was feeding him, some of the stuff ran down the ground, you know, and when uh, uh, when the guy walked away, when well, his teacher says, eat it, <laughs> oh, <you're laughs> oh, no, you know, and so the teacher went over and started picking it up, you know, and started eating it, and so, uh, uh both the dad was about ready to go, he says, how can you do that, he said, did you ever see a leper walk that fast, the guy was going in a trot, leaving, see, you know, and he said, the great Lord himself has come to teach you a lesson, so eat that, you know, and filled with all kinds of good vibes, you know, so, you know, you know, you've got to be pretty stupid to accept it, too. Oh, yes. <laughs> In other words, a good disciple has no mind of his own. He's like putty in the hands of a master. Well, all right, Prashad. I see Prashad. Most of the food in the ashram, uh, in the ashram or in the cosmic kitchen is all Prashad. It's blessed. I would not refuse to pick it up, even if the garbage can eat it. It's Prashad. Even if a roach was to walk over it, it's Prashad. <laughs> well, he's blessed already when he walked over it in the first place. His evolution is up. In actuality, you can say that about anything, Mr. Lay. Everything is for God. It depends on your attitude towards it, what it's going to do to you. Well, the, the only way you're going to know that it's truly Prashad and that the Lord is in it and that the flavor of the Lord's presence is in it is if you pick it up and put it in your mouth to find out. You'll have one tremendous experience. 
If you ever take LSD, it will taste like a triple dose of LSD. It says, if you ever in doubt that Prashad or the Lord's presence is in it, sometime when you pick it up and put it to him out and find out how it tastes, it would be entirely different than any other type of taste in your consciousness. And your whole mind will open up. What would make a person not experience anything different than he's ever experienced before? You know? Like if, uh, even when Master Sharon said, was here, he blessed the things on the table, and I eat some of it, you know, and it was just like he eats anything else. What would cause me to feel that way? Was I blocking? <laughs> okay. Well, then it doesn't matter whether it's blessed or not if I'm blocking. Oh, it matters a lot because in blocking you only delay the experience. Oh, it's coming then. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh man! You just oh my goodness! You just delayed the experience a little <laughs> longer than a normal time. Watch it! Watch it! <laughs> All right, let me ask you one question. You had some prashad, and oh, you, it's coming. you you didn't feel any experience, but how you felt? On your way home. On the way home. Mm. I don't remember, you know. But uh, well, there are different times, you know. I get all lighted up. That's what you mean. You know? Like now. <laughs> well, no, it's sort of like now. <laughs> all right, then you see the push out is like a delay time bomb. Every time you hit a low point, it goes off inside of you. Now you see what the Prashad really can do? It never leaves your system, even though you had it so many years ago. Everything that is uh, blessed or consecrated by the vibratory rate is Prashad, and it's like a, a time cycle capsule in the body. The moment you eat it, it may not have anything to do. And then afterwards, in a day or a half a day, or a few hours, the whole body seems to spark or let up. Or every time you hit a low period, it lets up. This is what Prashad is doing. Now, you take Tom Smith. You everybody know Tom Smith. Well, several years ago, he came to initiation. And uh, just as the initiation was over, he was on his way to South Carolina. Well, Tom Smith was at that critical moment where no belief in anything would matter. But there was Prashad, the only thing I could offer him, because he arrived at the time. And the Prashad was right there. And they hand him the prashad to drink. And I never saw Tom Smith until about several months after. And I got one big report of a changed man. Well, I didn't... I never doubt the Lord how he can change people. But when I arrived to see Tom Smith, you know Tom Smith. <laughs> I saw him as pretty low end too, Mr. Lay. <laughs> All right. But the prashad still pulls up. The change in consciousness is fantastic. He said when he got in the car and he started driving to South Carolina, it was like somebody unscrew his head and put it back. Just twist it around and put it on backwards. <laughs> like it was on backwards. It's funny how this thing works. Like, I didn't even know him at the time, but I financed you strip to come and see you. <laughs> <laughs> and then he came back and brought you with him <laughs> to see me. Fantastic. <laughs> And look who's here. <laughs> well, you know, actually, the Lord is wonderful. You're really the first initiate in Thailand. 